had a name. Oh, I can't remember. Welcome one and all. Hello everybody. My name is Adrian Abbott and I am the Director of Advancement here at King's and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our distinguished moderator today. Dr. John Godfrey, Member of Parliament, Editor of the Financial Post, Vice President of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, Author, Professor and Head of the, French, the Toronto French School, Dr. John Godfrey has had a rich and varied career. But here at King's, we like to think he is best known for being our president. Between, <laughs> there you go. In 1977 through 87, he helped us to usher in the School of Journalism. He increased student enrollment and achieved repeated fame as winner of the Godfrey Cup Fun Run. And uh, even today, after a winter injury, he finished today's run in great form. <laughs> Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, back to King's uh, Dr. John Godfrey as today's moderator. Well, thank you, uh, Adrian. I have to confess in the spirit of full disclosure, I am in, in an extremely grumpy mood today <laughs> uh, because it is true that I finished the Godfrey Cup it is not true that I won it. <laughs> and some young chap, uh, Nicholas, how dare you win my cup? <laughs> I also have to say that when I was living in the President's Lodge, I did have a, one of those answering tape devices which played the Hallelujah Chorus. Yes. And it was always that, King of Kings, hallelujah, hallelujah, so, which is a reference to, to my other title while I was here, not just president. <laughs> so today we've got two debates to get through in fairly short order. Uh, I'm proposing that we spend the, the first uh, 40 minutes on a very, very vexed topic, the ancients versus the moderns. Uh, We've got two excellent uh, defenders in the form of Dr. Angus Johnson, who was, uh, started out as a junior fellow, became an English professor. He's been part of the King's community for over 30 years. He's taught in the Department of Classics, served as vice president, and has directed the Foundation Year program. He's written on Plato, Aristotle, and Augustine, and he's tackling Hegel in his retirement. Hegel, not in Hegel's retirement, <laughs> his retirement. That's right, it's a Hegel. Older Hegel. I don't know if Hegel ever retired. When Hegel was past it. All right. He's also volunteering his time, knowledge, and passions to the Halifax Humanities 101, where he teaches and devises curricula. Meg Shields, who seems far too young to be defending the ancients, is a third year undergraduate student undertaking a combined honors in classics and early modern studies with a minor in theater studies. She tells us she habitually lurks around the King's Theatrical Society, Halliburton, and any society foolish enough to advertise free wine. <laughs> she will gladly talk your ear off about attic tragedy, which is not the tragedy of sorting out your attic. Uh, it is something else, apparently. Her favorite peasant revolt and the art of the grilled cheese. When she graduates, Meg will either continue her studies or work somewhere with a window. <laughs> On the modern side, the trendies, as we like to call them. Throw the t-shirt. <laughs> a nice subjective and, moderator. And <laughs> the more ancient I become, the less sympathetic I am <laughs> to the trendies. Dr. Laura Penny, a member of the first graduating class in contemporary studies in 1994, Laura taught in the foundation year contemporary studies and early modern studies programs at King's. She's the author of More Money Than Brains, Why School Sucks, College is Crap, and Idiots Think They're Right. That's, very, that's a very modern way of putting it, I might say. She also recently wrote and narrated an episode of Ideas for CBC Radio called The Fool's Dilemma. She is accompanied by Alex Bryant, the multi-talented Alex Bryant, who is Vice President of <laughs> Student Life 
for the upcoming mm -hmm. academic year and served as Vice President of Finance last year. When he isn't hard at work in the Students' Union office, he is pursuing a degree in Contemporary Studies and Philosophy with plans to graduate in 2016. I hope he fulfills his plans. Me too. He also <laughs> spends time hanging lights for the King's Theatrical Society and has a keen interest in Canadian small press publishers. So, those are the debaters for this round. The format is the following. The lead debater, the, the government side, which is Angus, defending the proposition, will speak for seven minutes. Laura, le loyal, we hope, leader of the opposition, however young she may be, um, will be giving her seven minutes. Then we go back to Meg, who has a three-minute rebuttal, and then back to Alex, who has a three-minute rebuttal. If there's time, I will then in invite members of the audience to speak either for or against the motion. We will wind up, if we have the time, with a rebuttal from each and a vote. And then we'll have a little break. So, without further ado, let me ask uh, that ancient of ancients, <laughs> <laughs> Angus, to begin. Thank you, honored moderator. And I appreciate the comments about the ancients. To my mind, uh, the debate between ancients and moderns is a debate about a state of mind. It's not, to my m view, about history. It's not about a particular time and place. I'm going to argue this morning that we have a question before us, a serious question, between the ancients and the moderns within our own souls. I'm going to make two philosophical points that are bound up in relation to this argument and come to a rather difficult uh, point uh, at the end, which uh, may be questionable, but I think is... <laughs> is frankly true. The philosophical points. Well, uh, I'm basing <clears throat> my whole argument on, of course, my world-famous t-shirt <laughs> made by Caleb Langell in the Quad with the wonderful quote from Aristotle. Can everybody read that? No. Uh, okay. I will, of course you can't, you're as old as I am. <laughs> it's the actuality of potentiality qua potentiality. All clear? <laughs> Is that all clear? Well, you remember this from King's study, right? This is the foundation of the foundation of your program. Uh, I will try and give you examples. This soccer ball, a World Cup reference. <laughs> Obscure. Yeah. Yes, Greece is in, in the world in the finals. Uh, <laughs> this soccer ball is here and potentially here. Is this okay? Now it's actually here. <laughs> This was self-evident uh, in a certain way to the Greeks. <laughs> but then they uh, noticed this. Like, what the heck was that? What was that? That was, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. It, it, that's right, it's a physics experiment, <laughs> and it's straight out of, the quote in fact is straight out of Aristotle's physics. That was what the ancients called motion. And motion is the potentiality, the actuality of the potential, potentially here, but not as actual, that is simply here, but qua potentiality. This okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me put it, I hope, in a way that you can understand. When you first came into the Queen, King's Quad as a student, here you are. 
and you are full of potential. Right now, I see people who have actually become something. This okay? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not saying everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you. We'll get to those questions. You're actually here now. In between is the crap, I mean, the, the, the wonderful life that has led you to this point. Is this okay? So that life, that process, that change that has led you here, now this is, this is my first point. Moderns take that process to be everything. So if you think that process, the in-between, the motion, the change, the endless becoming, if you think that's what's real, simply, then you're a modern, in my oversimplistic uh, argument here. If you take the potential and the actual to be significantly different and real, then you're thinking like an ancient. Now, I wondered about whether people, and especially King's alumni, thought as ancients or moderns. So I have been, in my years here, like Socrates. When you come back to King's, the first thing I tried was simply the, the kind of fatalistic nod of the head. Oh yes, you become a lawyer, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh so you, you are employed, uh-huh. You know. <laughs> now, believe it or not, the alumni never appreciate this view. You know, you simply are part of a fatal process that's gone on. So that made me believe, okay, there's some ancient thinking going on here. They actually distinguish their actuality from the process. So then I tried, when they came home, if I can put that, uh, as you all have today, and I'm delighted you have, when they came back, my reaction generally was delighted surprise. So, so they're letting you teach people. You, you're a pharmacist, aha. Uh -huh. I see legal drugs, aha, uh -huh. exactly. So you actually found people who would elect you to parliament? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, believe it or not, this shocked surprise approach did not go over well either. People were not happy that I was surprised that they had actually become something. This made me wonder, okay, now why? I, I'm delighted at what they have become. So what's, what's wrong? Why are they not appreciating my view? Well, I, I thought about this, and two things really informed my thinking. And the first was, a, a former student, actually, uh, and I, I, maybe I shouldn't do this, his name is Darcy Rhino. Is he, is he here? I just, I thought he might be here, but anyway. Uh, Darcy was in my tutorial years ago, and about uh, six years after that, am I getting too long? You've got one minute to go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, he sat beside me in the Rebecca Cohen out of the blue. He just came and sat turned to me and said, what did you see in me? Almost without preliminary, what did you see in me? Plato teaches that the good teacher will mirror back what the student is, but the trick is the student doesn't know yet that that's what they are. This beautiful potential that you came in with, that's what we see when you came to King's. And we still see it now. So frankly, the only positive or frankly uh, popular response that I've made to the alumni is 
tragic disappointment. <laughs> tragic disappointment. You, and sometimes I add a, a little phrase, uh, you, you could have been prime minister. And then I say, those bastards. <laughs> well, so I'm afraid that's, that, that was a compliment. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd get one more minute. <laughs> Who says? <laughs> so I'm arguing two things here. One is that uh, you adore your former selves. That's why you're here, and in a certain way, that's why we adore you too, because of the student life, your ancient self, and you distinguish strongly between your potential, your actuality, and the process. That is, you think like ancients. Thank you. Well. Laura Penny, and let's see if you can do a modern seven minutes. <laughs> I shall endeavor to do so. Uh, now, many of you will be aware that the original debates between the ancients and the moderns took place in the 17th and 18th centuries and were primarily debates about literary style. Who wrote better, the ancients or the moderns? Now, of course, my darling colleague Angus has not chosen to define the debate in these terms, which is too bad because that's a debate he actually could have won. <laughs> he could have come in here with a copy of the Odyssey and a copy of Twilight, and Alex and I would have had to slink away in shame <laughs> at the idiocy of our age. But instead, my distinguished colleague has made a series of moral and metaphysical claims that I do not think the ancient world can sustain. Aristotle, this would be the same Aristotle who contended that some people were just born slaves, nothing you can do about it, just born to serve and that's it. This would also be the same Aristotle who contended that women were deformed, tiny men. And I will stand at this moment to show you that the modern world is at least taller than the ancient <laughs> world. <laughs> So again... But you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Fair here, enough. Here. But the view is still better, Dr. Godfrey. <laughs> so Aristotle, brilliant guy, terrific beard, just like my opponent. <laughs> but the fact remains that for years and years and years and years and years, very few people had access to the genius of Aristotle. And I would like to take up Angus's statements about potential in a slightly different way. I would like us to think about what this debate would look like if we were, in fact, in the ancient world. And I'm not, really, I'm not merely referring to all our technical advantages, the fact that this debate is being live streamed, hello out there in the web, <laughs> the fact that we have better audiovisual resources, the fact that we have lighting, no, I'm referring to the fact that if this debate was taking place in the ancient world, certainly Meg and I would not be speaking. Meg and I would be home with our children that had yet to die. If we were lucky! Otherwise, we would be slaves or, quite frankly, extremely incompetent prostitutes. <laughs> so... Now that we've had some fun with Aristotle, let's move on to some different philosophers, equally beloved by King's folk, some of which I hope you will remember from what you remember of Phip. Let's think about Kant's contention that we're all free. Or better yet, let's think of Hegel's contention that in the Greek and Roman world, only some were free. Only the happy few were free. But that what modernity is, is progress in the consciousness of freedom. What modernity is, is more and more people being able to sit in rooms like Alumni Hall, regardless of their gender, station, or birth, and share in the work of the ancient world. That, to me, is a much more significant reading of potential. Think of all the books that we are never able to assign on the FIP curriculum because they don't exist because people did not have the education, leisure, or community of reception to write them. A 
other things that are big improvements in the modern world. We are not nearly as often molested by disguised gods masquerading as swans or showers of gold. <laughs> I knew Ottawa was interesting, but not that interesting, <laughs> Dr. Godfrey. You're skating on thin ice. <laughs> <laughs> Second, think of how, how many fewer babies are left exposed on hillsides on account of some prophecy. Third, think of how much more infrequently we turn into birds <laughs> or plants <laughs> as a result of some traumatic incident. We have there is another thinker I would like to bring up here. And that thinker, beloved again by many fippers, I'm sure some of you will fondly remember being deeply confused by the wasteland. <laughs> that would be T.S. Eliot. In his tradition and the individual talent, Eliot maintains that we know so much more than the ancients, precisely, and they are that which we know. I would argue that there are more people now reading Plato, reading Aristotle, reading Hegel than was ever possible in their own age. And it is precisely that sort of freedom, that sort of expansion of possibility and potential that marks modernity and makes modernity an improvement over the ancient world. We have them. They do not have us. We share in them. We extend the work of Plato and Aristotle to people regardless, again, of birth, gender, or social station. So, with all due respect to my impressively bearded opponent, with all due respect to figures like Aristotle and Plato, I would argue that modernity is the fulfillment in many ways of the promise of the ancient world, a promise that was limited by prejudice, by class, by things that we still struggle with, but that we take as our task to improve. No, well, thank you. And now I would ask Meg Shields to give a three-minute rebuttal of all of that. Privileged by the basic passage of time, moderns have the good fortune of being able to engage with, the ancient, with ancient thought while co-currently generating new and exciting philosophical, aesthetic, and political content. Naturally, moderns have taken advantage of their vast superior perspective to create such marvelous and inspired innovations as the reversible sweater, butter which is not in fact butter, <laughs> and turducken. Truly we, live in, <laughs> truly, we live in an age of progress and are putting the brains produced by millennia of evolutionary grinding to good use. Our most astounding achievement is most likely the internet, which naturally we have elected to use for the express purpose of watching cats do cute stuff. <laughs> Speaking of the internet, in the ancient period, being messed with by governments was fairly straightforward, as spears in the chest tend to be. When you're being dragged by your hair through the charred carcasses of your village by a centurion, the thought, <laughs> hmm, I wonder if this is the government's doing, need not cross one's mind. <laughs> Ingeniously, our governments have cut out the middleman and have, um, by having us enslave and kill ourselves by way of Netflix, corn, sugar, and fat. There's something to be said about governments being accountable for, their horrendous evil, for the horrendous evils that they commit against their people. It's all we can do now to vaguely shake our fists at faceless corporations. I maintain that the ancients had better civil uh, unrest, this owing primarily to their prolonged detention spans and absence of Twitter. A hashtag, I'm Spartacus, at the emperor does not a slave revolt make. <laughs> <laughs> the average Greek was an illiterate farmer, and though this person certainly lived a difficult life with, what with being depraved from butter, which is not in fact butter, he would have been much more aware of where his food was coming from and exceedingly more in uh, intimate with the animals he elected to eat. 
That slavery and sexism were prevalent in the ancient world is an undeniable reality, but I wonder if that trumps the industrialized slaughter we have currently subject, um, subjected untold quantities of animals to so that we might satisfy our own selfish needs. I invoke the word slaughter to illuminate that the Greeks did kill animals, in, um, but it was personal and done with full conscious, consciousness, where today, we are oblivious and complicit to the process by which meat gets on our plates. I'd like to conclude with what I believe to be a tragedy that rivals that time that Oedipus found out to what degree he was a mama's boy. <laughs> I am, of course, referring to the cruelest innovation of modernity, clothing and sports. Only modernity could conceive of a, such a heinous evil as concealing the most physically fit and attractive demographic of our society. Once, sport was an honorable institution that helped starving peasants and presumably women wearing beards forget what horrible impending deaths they were facing by cheering for the horrible impending deaths of naked athletes. What a shame. Instead of, <laughs> instead of the totally honorable and dignified sport of watching unclothed men in their, in their physical prime beating each other up within an inch of their lives, we have speed walking and curling. I hope you're happy. Thank you. <laughs> I also hope, despite the spirit of the World Cup, that no one's going to bite anybody today. That's <laughs> so, Alex, if you could just keep your teeth to yourself. <laughs> well, I had prepared a biting response to, <laughs> to what I expected Angus's opening arguments to be. I found there were none. Um, <laughs> but I, I will read it anyways in response to his appeal to all of your nostalgia. The assumption, oh. I'll open this later. So the assumption of superiority in our opponent's opening comments exposes their nostalgia for a time they didn't live through. One might expect that Angus and Megan have cherry-picked authors to speak about, except Angus only spoke about one, from Greece and Rome in, their, in the way that one might pick photos from the archives for reunion conjuring up only the best memories of antiquity and presenting this curated exhibition to the audience for their own good. In fact, this is the same kind of myth-making in the face of death that Socrates delivers in the Republic as the noble lie, and what Socrates tells Simeus and Cabes in the Phaedo when he faces his own death to convince them to continue to study philosophy. As Laura has pointed out, this kind of historical cherry-picking is both nefarious and a problematic trope of our ancient counterparts. This kind of pseudo-archaeology untied from the present has actually often been picked up by nationalism in Europe for their own good. I worry that one cannot properly um, study the ancients without being firmly grounded in the present, as Laura has already stated. That's what I got. Well, thank you very much. Well. <laughs> Well, now we come to the point where we turn it over to the commons, that is to say you. So we are uh, entertaining comments from the floor in an orderly way. It would be nice if they were you know, one for the ancients and one for the moderns, but I suspect you're much too unruly to put up with a rule like that. Uh, so we will, uh, we will invite people. Now, in order to do this, because we're being recorded, I guess what they'll have, people will have to do is come down and speak uh, from this microphone for a minute or so. So, ancient or modern? The mic oh, you got the mic. Oh. <laughs> He's the guy with the mic. He's not going to speak. Test, test. Is that a mic from under? Oh, do we have, a, do we have a, an ancient or a modern or somewhere in a middle age? <laughs> <laughs> ah. That gentleman there. Identify yourself, please. David Fletcher, 81. This has seemed to have denigrated into a conversation about lifestyle and technology. And I find it facile from the moderns and predictable from the ancients. <laughs> and I would like to hear something about more than whether we eat farmed meat or whether we can celebrate publication and literacy. For the record, I refrain from mentioning iPhone antibiotics flight 
I mean, I'm sure many of you came here via Air Canada, and my condolences to you. But that, that still that's means only, that's only plummeting it. into the sea in a blaze of wax and feathers. I did not make the technological argument in favor of modernity. I would like the record to show that my argument hewed to the terms set by my colleague, and instead I made a moral and political argument for modernity. Although we could sit here all day and talk about how great it is to have televisions and cars and computers and antibiotics. I did not do that, sir. <laughs> my only disagreement with you is that your, your assertion that Air Canada is the worst airline, we came by <laughs> Porter, and I can say Porter's won. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Who else would like to pitch? Ah, there's a... I'm posing this to uh, Meg. Uh, you were uh, commenting about the dec decline of uh, sports uh, with, uh, with uh, we don't see naked men beating some others to death. Well, we... A shame. Have, we have uh, some sports today, which... Uh, which uh, guys nearly naked beat each other up, like uh, boxing, uh, cage fighting, like uh, UFC or professional wrestling. <laughs> Anyhow, we have uh, hockey fights, uh, so uh, <laughs> how can you say uh, sports are in decline? <laughs> hmm. Well, thank you for that. Other comments? I believe there are also naked people on the internet. Oh, there's a, there's a. There's a <laughs> I think she gets the result. What? <laughs> Comment up there. Way up there. Just there. Just yep. just <laughs> right. <laughs> just a few. This is it's becoming like reduced to an argument about naked people. That was, as my intention was from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, yes. Um, Identify yourself, please. Pardon me? Identify yourself. Uh, my name is Michael McCullough. Um, uh, the question that I would like to ask is, or pose is the concept of what is better. You said the ancients versus modern. And then you more or less discussed things that I might construe to be semantics. Um, better in what form? Uh, better in a state of mind? or better in a quality of life. Uh, how um, and where has uh, the value of this been addressed? Okay. Anyone have any? Well, th 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 that's what I was hoping. Um, I was hoping to get out of the arguments about either technological or moral process and get to the question uh, of our view of process, progress, evolution, motion. Uh, the as modern assumption is that motion simply exists. For Aristotle and the ancients, mo motion was a puzzle. And to my mind, we have to recapture that sense of potential and actual in a way which is beyond uh, technological or uh, moral judgment. Seeing no, uh, oh, there's one more over there. Yeah. Hey, Just while he's going, I have an ancient sculpture and the contemporary form of Andy Warhol. <laughs> Campbell's soup in a box. V8 autumn carrot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark DeWolf, Dr. Godfrey. Um, the debate almost predictably has uh, touched upon both our, our physical, economic uh, well being and so on, but uh, thanks to Angus, uh, also the way we think the way we feel about things. Um, I hope that one of the things that would come out of the debate, and perhaps some of our uh, worthy debaters today have a thought on this, um, there may be an assumption that we are the moderns, but in fact, because of the process, actually we're just somewhere in the middle of something much bigger. 
So perhaps we could start thinking about the future as well. Do you have something to, think, uh, to say about how the modernity of today might in fact fit into a wider uh, time frame and a wider frame of uh, both moral uh, attitudes uh, and, uh, and even technology, I suppose. Do you want to add? Go for it. Okay, so Brian, I, um, yes. Good question. Are we answering? Of course, typically it was such a Canadian intervention. He wants now three categories. <laughs> he, <laughs> the future. <laughs> the ancients, the moderns, and somewhere in the middle. I don't, we don't have, well actually we could have three categories. So what I propose we do now is we call for a division of the house, which is the vote. Uh, and because of Mark's useful suggestion, I'm going to uh, say that you have a chance, you, you must, oh, you can only vote rebuttal. once. That's, that's a fundamental rule. We don't, we don't get the final rebuttals? I don't think we have final okay. rebuttals because we have another debate coming up. Well, there's, <laughs> this is there is ancient a, tyranny. At least, uh, uh oh. We go really quickly. All right, a really quick. Do a really do, quick. Can we do that? Quick, oh. quick. quick. Well, okay, can Angus, go ahead. Okay. Do you want to start off? Or? Um, I'll defer to my yeah. distinguished colleague. Kick it old school. Do you want to do this? Would you, uh, let's do that. Uh, Megan and I have, uh, we, just, we just wanted to um, say that to my mind, King's College is the belief that uh, the liberal arts should be defended. And whether that involves the ancients or the moderns, that's, that's really a secondary question. Uh, and what, what I'm about to say then is not a criticism of Kings. It's rather uh, that we're proud to be related to a place that has the courage to defend the liberal arts. I, I think, as John said, you know that uh, Laura has written an indictment of North American education called more money than brains. Uh, we have made her this t-shirt. It says, I teach at Kings. More brains than money. <laughs> oh. oh God, that's funny. That's so funny. Thank you, George. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Angus. And I see that George Cooper is weeping quietly. I will keep my rebuttal to one line and one line only. I think it would be Whig history and hubris to maintain that we know more than the ancients. One of the pleasures of working at this fine institution is getting to revisit them each and every year. But I will maintain that more of us are allowed to know. More of us get to know. Not that we know more, but that more of us get to know is the great advantage of the ancient world, the modern world. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I need you two folks to come and count for me. Come up. I need you to, we need, we're doing a count because there are three sections. Uh, so we've got not two choices, but under this unusual set of circumstances, three choices. You may vote for the ancients, you may vote for the moderns, or you may vote for the middle, the middle ages. So let us then, now what I want to do in order that we be efficient is if you would count, I'll count this section, you count that section, and you count that section. Yeah. All right, so, so all who are in favor and support the ancients, please stand. No, stand. All right. Is this for the modern, the ancient? Traitors. Just you guys or us? Is this them or us? You. You. Oh, come on, come on, people. And, and, uh, what did I have over there? Wait a minute. Uh, uh, 14, there's one that would like to stand up. 15, 30. All right. Sandra. Uh -huh. Please be seated. The, all right, all in favor of the moderns. Oh, we got Neil. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> we got Kim. Right on. Here we go. Six and three. Is 
Oh my goodness. Thank you. Uh, okay, yep. All right. And then, <laughs> and then for the Canadians in the house, who's in the middle? <laughs> All right. Oh, it's, <laughs> is this a, does it feel like an abstention? All right. I guess so. I guess you How can many like times can they vote? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I am pleased to announce the results, which are quite decisive. The ancients, 30. The moderns, 46. <laughs> and the middling, muddling, <laughs> the Canadians. middle ages Canadians are 13. So let's have a hand for the winners. <laughs> the modern. Well, thank you, debaters. We'll have a five-minute stand-up, uh, and we'll switch the players, and then we'll get at it again. This will be all a very different one. This, the, the subject is, be it resolved, that Twitter... And we got t-shirts. Twitter is the future of news. So, seventh inning stand. Well, congratulations.
so. Hello, everybody. Strategizing. So we should turn it a little bit, yes? Uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please resume your seats for round two. But we are, we can be heard better. Hi, Angus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. How are you? Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Well, welcome back for the second of our debates. This one is on the subject, be it resolved that Twitter is the future of news. To debate this proposition, we have uh, on the pro side, the government side, we have Sue Newhook, who teaches video and television reporting at the King's School of Journalism. In a former life, she was a news and current affairs journalist for the CBC. She's committed to online journalism and is a dedicated tweeter, but not necessarily a twit. No, um, but she never tweets pictures of what she's having for lunch, and I hope you don't do cats either. Um, David Lestraco has swapped the rough and tumble of the football field for the rough and tumble of investigative journalism. After graduating from Queen's University with a degree in history and a share of the glory as player on the 2009 Vanier Cup National Championship football team. A true, a true heavyweight here. Uh, he recently crossed the stage again to collect a Bachelor of Journalism from King's in 2014. He's now in the investigative stream of the Master of Journalism program at King's and blogs about sports in his free time. Stephen Kimber, with his, oh, they've got their two King's hats on, my goodness. Uh, Stephen is an award-winning writer, editor, and broadcaster whose writing has appeared in almost all major Canadian magazines and newspapers. He currently writes a weekly column for Halifax Metro, serves as senior features writer for the Coast and is a contributing editor of Atlantic Business Magazine. He's the author of a novel and eight works of nonfiction, the most recent of which is What Lies Across the Water, The Real Story of the Cuban Five. Evie Hornbeck graduated from King's in 2012 with a combined honors degree in journalism and history of science and technology. Since graduating, she has worked at CBC Radio and she is the founding managing editor of Mixtape Magazine. Evie is now working as a birth doula and living in Halifax. She is a regular contributor to Tidings and this past year she sang in the King's Chorus. So we will be using the same format with a slight variation. The, uh, the team that is pro Twitter is going to divide their seven minutes between them. You still only have seven minutes, though. And I don't mean an Angus kind of seven <laughs> minutes. I mean like a real modern seven minutes, which you know, goes by the watch and that old fashioned thing. I don't know whether- We're gonna do that too. They're, they're, they're gonna do the same. We're democratic. And then we come back for a rebuttal, three minutes. I don't know who's gonna do that. They don't know who's gonna do that. We'll find out. And the same will happen over here, and then we'll open it up to you to, uh, to comment, and then we'll have a vote. So, uh, we'll have a, maybe a little rebuttal, too. Why don't we throw a little rebuttal in? Oh, we have closing end. statements. Oh, we you, do. okay, you've got closing statements. It sounds ominous. It sounds like <laughs> one of those prime ministerial debates. Mm. Anyway, okay, so with that, uh, let me ask 
for the case to be put uh, to in favor of Twitter. Please begin. Okay. Thank you and <coughs> good morning. Can everyone hear me up in the back? This little blue bird represents the future of news. Twitter shares many of the qualities found in our best journalism. First, it presents the classic challenge. What you get out of it depends in large part on what you bring to it and what you put into it. Second, Twitter can grow, adapt, and improve. If it doesn't, it will be replaced. And it's true that Twitter started out as a kind of Facebook for really lazy people, but it has evolved to become infinitely more powerful. Third, and most important, Twitter is democratic. Everyone can engage, even if that means things get a little messy sometimes. But democracy is like that. Also like democracy, Twitter needs a little background information for you to make the most of it. And we know that many people here may not be that familiar with Twitter, so we've prepared a short primer. <laughs> Step one, create your account. This does involve handing over some personal information, but it's much less than the federal government and most major spy agencies already have. <coughs> <laughs> we'll have to get back to that. <laughs> Step two, follow people and organizations you respect and or like. Twitter is not an uncontrolled fire hose of OMGs, exclamation points, and pictures of Kim Kardashian. <laughs> you get to pick. Me, I follow hundreds of journalists and journalism organizations all over the world. And I also like to have a bit of fun, and I can't recommend Grammar Hulk and Editor Hulk strongly enough. <laughs> Hulk smash bad grammar. Hulk help make the books better. Um, you can have fun, but it's up to you what kind of diet you set. And that's it. You can start. You don't, we don't have time here to show you the full depth and range of journalism that you can find on and through Twitter, but we can point out a couple of the main ways that Twitter has evolved and adapted from lazy Facebook to something that is such an amazing support for news reporting. The first adaptation is the shortened web link. This is not going to go on Twitter, but 140 characters is just the beginning when your tweet can be shortened to this and become a headline, or the caption for a telling image. Now, the Hudson River plane crash happened just a few months ago, Twitter's net before, a few months before Twitter's next big thing happened. And that, of course, is hashtags. Now, hashtags, many people misuse them for fun or irony. Guilty. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> used properly, Hashtags become search tools for breaking news and topics. They range from the world shaking to the heartbreaking to the utterly main mundane. If you can't get through the rotary in the morning, hashtag Halifax traffic. It works. There are other elements and tools, but bottom line, when news is breaking, when I need to know what's going on, I may turn on the TV or the radio, but I always turn on Twitter. And this is the key reason for journalists to embrace it and other social media, the preservation of our very democracy. If we don't stake our place, others will, because anyone can. As more and more people turn to Twitter and its siblings for information, responsible professional journalists and journalism must be there, helping to inform and preserve democracy itself. Ooh. And now, I hand over to my friend and now colleague, David Scott. Applause when they just say my name. I think we already won. <laughs> so great to be here. I heard this is the uh, first debate Stephen Kimber's ever been in that didn't involve copious amounts of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's what you think. <laughs> News virus? <laughs> <laughs> well, he'll, he'll need that to argue his point. <laughs> Twitter is the future of news. You know, for example, a few months ago, right here at the, uh, the J School, we heard this story, a little bit of hearsay about a 
student at St. Mary's University who was scared of eating in his own cafeteria because he heard about, you know, he was scared of the football players and their hate speech towards them. So, you know, back in the old days, we would have had to do something unethical and try to go undercover to figure out if this was true. But what did we do? Well, we, uh, we checked their Twitter feeds and we saw that this was a real occurrence and, uh, you know, so we called them on it. We went down there and we said, you know, what's going on? And they, of course they tried to backpedal, but it was there. It was in print, it was in text, things that you wouldn't believe people would say about their fellow humans on this earth, let alone people to go to school with. And the result of that was people were fired and people were suspended. And, you know, through the use of Twitter as a news gathering tool, that was the only way that that, that type of story was possible. He's already trying to sabotage. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> order, order. That's how you know you have a strong point. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, anyways, so the legacy of that story was a national news story and even international. I was in Times Square a few months ago and saw the, almost the exact same story about American athletes, um, college athletes and their social media presence. So, you know, years ago the Newswire drove news and uh, it was a you know, subscription-based service that turned out most of the broadcast and print content that people had. But now that same Newswire is free to everyone. It's online, it's, it's being spit out in 140 characters every second you can imagine and it's not just the Canadian Newswires that you can get in Canada, it's the Associated Press, it's Reuters, it's the, uh, you know, it's the Canadian press, it's everything else. And, uh, you know, if you're not on Twitter as a journalist, you're probably unemployed or soon will be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and now the dynamic duo of Stephen and Evie. Be it resolved that Twitter is the future of news. If you're live tweeting this, you've just eaten up 51 of your 140 characters. <laughs> 89 to go. Throw in a few hashtags. Hashtag Kings225. Hashtag Boring Talking Heads. And perhaps include a few at Twitter handles in hopes that someone out there in the Twitterverse will actually read your pathetic post among the 500 million non-messages tweeted on this very day, that is 6,000 messages per second, and you may have space to answer our question with a yes or no. <laughs> Twitter gives new meaning to the term, all the news that's fit to print. So let me suggest an alternative proposition. Be it resolved that Twitter is the past of news. That not, not only gives you a few more characters to work with, but it's also a more logical argument. When I started in journalism, admittedly before the internet, before computers, before even electric typewriters, before if you light. Must know the truth, <laughs> we had Twitter, but we didn't call it that. We called them writing headlines, tightly written, character counted, copy fitted, witty, wise, and our headlines appeared above actual stories you could read without having to click on a, click on a link that took you to a personalized pop-up commercial that perhaps led to a news story. Back in my day, we tweeted, <coughs> but we didn't call it that either. We called it taking notes. And we were smart enough to keep those notes in our notebooks where they belonged until after the event when we could organize our mess of quotes, random jottings, personal shorthand, and occasional uh, little pictures <clears throat> into a story that made sense, that had been fact-checked and proofread, that offered context, that was in short journalism. I don't want to read a journalist's raw notes, neither do you. The problem with tweeting is that you're so busy being a twit, you don't have time to pay attention to what's actually happening around you to have time to commit an act of journalism. Twitter is not the future of journalism, it is the dumbing down of journalism. Consider the co-founder of Twitter, Evan Williams. 
Quote, news in general doesn't matter most of the time, he says. Remember, he's the founder, co-founder of Twitter and the future. And most people would be far better off if they spent their time consuming less news and more ideas that have a lasting import. Which is why he invested the billions that he made from Twitter in creating a new long-form journalism app. Can anyone seriously suggest Twitter is the future of journalism when my dictionary still defines Twitter, the noun, first as, quote, a series of short, high-pitched calls or sounds and lists as synonyms chirp, chirp, beep, trill, warble. <laughs> chirp is the future of news. I rest my case and turn it over to my colleague. <laughs> I know, she's a So Twitter is the shiny new toy, which of course is exciting to journalists. New, shiny, let's chase it, let's follow it. But as much as we love a new toy, we are selling ourselves short by putting our stock in Twitter and also probably rotting our attention spans to those of prepubescent boys. Twitter is, to be fair, how I learned some very important news over the years. For instance, the death of Gordon Lightfoot, as well as the death of Nelson Mandela about two or three months before he actually died. As well, I also learned about the tragic news that Justin Bieber had gotten cancer and I should shave my head in order to show my solidarity with him, but luckily I fact-checked that before getting out my scissors. If truth is at a disadvantage because a lie can get around the world before the truth gets its shoes on, Twitter is feeding speed to the lie. To be fair, these are some pretty big gaffes that I mentioned. Although the Nelson Mandela one really got me. I was in the wardroom with several other King students and we poured out a drink for Nelson Mandela only to learn he was still alive. Whoops, someone had been Twitter happy at a German newspaper. So we do need to be a bit careful though, and that's what this shows. So how far can we actually get with Twitter? Can we evaluate the sources? Can we look at the people? It's pretty hard to do when you're sitting behind a desk, which is, by the way, what I think Twitter encourages us to do based on my experience of how it's used in newsrooms. So what skills are we pushing aside here? I mean, I came out of journalism school being able to social media as easily as breathe or talk, but that doesn't mean I really should. I mean, okay, I'm as self-entitled and overconfident as any millennial, really, but at least I know that probably I should not be allowed to use these skills in the way that many newsrooms are letting recent grads use them. And as for the seasoned reporters who are now being shuffled into seminars on how to use a hashtag, is this really the best use of their time? I would argue no. Definitely not. So as this legacy media is eaten by the digital media that is moving forward with things like Twitter, these companies are actually growing. This is great. This must be the future of news then. I must be wrong. Stop kicking the thing. <laughs> thanks, the problem thanks. with this is that these outlets are growing at a much slower pace than the legacy media are shedding journalists. Also, most of these, according to the Pew Research Center, identify themselves as hyper-local outlets, which leaves a huge gap for the further um, looking at the bigger picture that we really need, and of course, we're not going to get on Twitter. And with the exception of a couple of stories, what are the real stories we're getting on Twitter as we're living on the internet? Uh, tabloid stories. Rihanna and Drake tweeted at each other, totally back together. That's what I learned on Twitter. But people love Twitter, you tell me. We gotta be where the people are. We gotta get to them to see what, so that we can give them the news that they need. Okay, so we are at a journalism school, so for a second I'll get on my high horse before I'm done. We are presenting important information needed for the future of democracy and for people to make accurate choices in their lives. And I would say we need to make sure that the way we communicate it is as effective as what we're communicating and Twitter is not that way. So we now proceed to uh, a three-minute rebuttal, uh, divided in whatever fashion <laughs> the government side wishes between Sue and Dave. Thank you. Largely inconsequential noise. It's true they didn't take it seriously when they started it. 
And as I said, as we said earlier, evolution has made Twitter infinitely more powerful and useful. Think about the work of our own Stephen Puttycomb when he went to the, Haiti, the earthquake in Haiti. <coughs> one tweet at a time, one sentence at a time, he became a wire service that told an intensely human and moving story. They weren't his raw notes, they were his raw impressions that were later turned into full stories. When we think about the very word Twitter, it is funny. But didn't Google sound sort of dumb when it came out? <laughs> As for mistaken headlines, Stephen, Dewey defeats Truman. <laughs> <laughs> People have always made mistakes. It's why we call journalism history on the run. It's all the more reason critical thinking must come into play using Twitter as we use any other tool. And as for dumbing things down, please, I've been defending television news for 30 years, okay? Um, and I quote the immortal Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek, of course 95% of it is junk. 95% of everything is junk. <laughs> our challenge, our challenge is not to live on cotton candy, but to look for the solid diet of news and information that we need as a democracy. Dave. Yeah, Twitter is democracy. It's power. It's the Arab Spring. It's a revolution to overthrow a government by using social interactions and common hashtags. Legacy media is crumbling. For example, just a couple days ago, the CBC is cutting back, streamlining to what? An online friendly content, eliminating traditional legacy media jobs. And how are they promoting it? Well, with their 500 to, well, a million Twitter followers. The challenge with Twitter is to find the filtered excellence, to find people you know, to find organizations that are verified, like The Guardian, like the BBC, like the CBC, like all those newspapers Stephen Kimber loves. Journalism that comes out of Twitter is journalism for the public, not journalism to please other journalists. That's all. <laughs> Part of the thing about Twitter is you have to know how to end it. <laughs> <laughs> and now, <laughs> Stephen and Evie. So um, as Sue has said, Twitter is what you put into it. Um, and now that I know she's not going to be tweeting anything about cats, I'm totally unfollowing her. Because as Meg has said, that's really the strength of the internet. Let's be real. Cat videos. So, um, but something that they have mentioned is actually a big problem, which is that Twitter is democratic and you can get a feel for what people are saying based on Twitter. Um, and actually the problem is that Twitter does not represent the society we are actually based in. And a lot of the underserved people, which we as journalists say we are trying to reach, actually aren't on Twitter. Um, internet connectivity in our very large and with a lot of very rural areas in this country is actually a big problem. Are those people on Twitter? Probably not. Are the underserved who aren't able to afford uh, internet connection on Twitter? No. I mean, we have heard that by the UN that connected to the high-speed internet connection should be a human right, which is an interesting statement in itself, but unfortunately we're not there yet. So the people who are able to actually interact on Twitter are already the in crowd, and that's not helping anybody. Okay. We could have uh, use props. We thought about using props. We, we had a Tweety Bird uh, cartoon being crushed, and we were going to use that, but we thought we didn't really need that. Uh, yeah, as fell back to on hats. Our worthy opponents. <laughs> now, our worthy opponent, uh, Dave Lestracco, if you say by David Lestracco, it's a great byline. Do you know what his Twitter handle is? It's News Virus. Is that really a byline you would trust? Seems, seems talks, to be working. He talks about, he talks about crowdsourcing and, and, and news, and, and, and I will give him that that was a wonderful, uh, brilliant story that the online news workshop did this year. 
Uh, but let me give you some examples of crowdsourcing of another sort. This is from my Twitter feed this morning. What does one wear to a wedding, and can it be either of these, which accompanied a photo? <laughs> Retweet if you all worked out this weekend or plan on working out this weekend. Wearing my dart carousel t-shirt to the gym, bet it will spark conversations. <laughs> You're trying to compete with 500 million of these messages? One last thing. Um, Twitter went public uh, last February. It's lost 40% uh, of its value since then. And according to brokers, if you own Twitter stock, you are the owner of a niche product whose potential is fading. Thank you. <laughs> so now this is the chance for you to speak in what, more than 140 characters, uh, actually out loud, the old-fashioned way. We have the microphone. We. Uh, We'll not get into a pro and con, I, I, that is to say we're not going to alternate, that's going to be too complicated. So anybody who would like to comment, and I, boy, I, we're starting at the top with President Hooper. <laughs> <laughs> President, hashtag, mm -hmm. Hooper. <laughs> <coughs> when you're old and uh, getting more and more and more set in your ways, you pick up the paper and you go first to whatever page appeals to you, the sports page, or you go to the editorial page, or you go to Stephen Kimber and you read that and you want to throw the rest of the paper aside, but suddenly, out of the corner of your eye, you see something that John Godfrey has written. You never would have thought that John Godfrey would actually have an article in the paper, but he does. <laughs> and, so, and so you take a moment and you glance at it, and uh, you perhaps are enlightened or perhaps not. <laughs> With Twitter, you have to self-select everything, and there's a kind of a self-ratifying circularity or self-ratifying sense of becoming even more certain about the truths that you already know because you're decrepit and you're old and you just don't want it see anything new. Newspapers, even television broadcasts, expose you to things that you wouldn't be exposed to if you have to self-select every single article that you uh, might want to read among the 500 million or 500,000 or whatever it is per day that comes out of the Twitter verse. So how do you, how do you force old, decrepit, uh, people like me, completely set in their ways, how do you force us in the Twitterverse to actually be exposed to things that we mightn't otherwise know? A good point. George, Anybody I should only... We, we think he's a good president ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I should only be old and decrepit like you. Sign me up. Um, part of a balanced diet is making sure that you get a mix of nutrients and a little bit of candy as I was saying earlier. Um, when you are following things on Twitter, if you follow enough sources, you can see a range of people. And when you check their individual posts and articles that come out of a tweet, you will still see the article by John Godfrey alongside the piece by Stephen Kimber or whomever. So the challenge becomes not breadth, but making sure that you maintain focus, that you don't scan, even as we scan newspapers, I mean, who read every single word of the newspaper in a hard copy this morning? Nobody. But as you look at, as you look at individual pieces, um, think you, your challenge is not missing other points of view. It's making sure you remember where you started out, and I will admit that. The problem is, though, as we're scanning through the newspaper, we at least have a chance of catching our eye on not only that article, but the words that come with it. Whereas scanning through my Twitter, I'll catch a bit of something and, some, and not actually go anywhere with it. If you're scanning through Twitter, you're going to scan a headline. You have almost no chance of scanning that article or catching anything that way. Um, I can't think of how many times someone has said to me, oh, yeah, I saw this thing on, let's, did you read the article about, and I said, oh, yeah, no, I read that. Did I read it? No, I'd read the headline on Twitter, and that's enough these days. That seems to be accepted. Other comments oh. Uh, over here. Oh, I can. Uh, I can. Oh, no. I see. Go ahead. Take a microphone over to this gentleman, please. 
Ja. Thanks very much, Ian Johnson, class of 72. Um, I am a Twitter follower, so I'm a user, <laughs> but I think, Sue, you just made the point that, that I think is important, and that is that Twitter is one of several possible media that can expand and add to, to the news. So in some ways, you've undermined, I think, your own argument and to the extent that it, it's not by itself sufficient, but, but in conjunction with a whole range of online and other media, that may be the future of news. And I guess that raises the question, which I'd invite your comment on, is what is news in the future? I mean, what do we see as news? Just to your point, I don't think any one thing is a future of news, but I certainly we win. think <laughs> of Twitter. I think she wants to call but a vote speaking, right now. Speaking, <laughs> speaking metaphorically, Twitter is an avatar for the future of news. Um, that it connects you to a broad range of sources that were unimaginable 10 years ago. Um, so that's what I would say. I would say that the future is, there, there are other issues beyond tools like Twitter. If you think, if, you, if somebody said to you 20 years ago that, that Microsoft Word was the future of writing, so our whole argument, our whole conversation may have a, an underlying problem of semantics almost, but Microsoft Word did change <laughs> writing, but it was not the future of writing. It was a harbinger, it was though a harbinger for the future of writing. And Twitter is very much like that. Um, what the future holds, see more brains, less money. Um, <laughs> nobody knows. Dave does. Dave knows. Uh, uh, you need a, you need a hand. Okay, uh, Michael. Oh, Did you want to say Sorry, go ahead. Uh, hang on. The, hang on. Michael Nickel. Hang on, Mike. Just a second. Go ahead, David. Sorry, we are. Uh, you know, we are on the side of the future of news, where we aren't making the argument for the past of news, the broad, the traditional broadcast, the legacy media, the newspapers. You know, Twitter is this a microcosm of the future of news. And sadly, if you follow any of what's going on in uh, legacy media, that's definitely not the future of news. Michael. Okay, Michael Nickel. Uh, despite what Stephen said, uh, I must point out that they're using a tra uh, that the opposition is using a transparent uh, device to prejudice the uh, the audience in favor of their side, i.e., their kings. And I, just, and I just want to let them know that in my case, it's worked perfectly. <laughs> we'll take that. All right. A question I've got uh, for, for everybody is whether this debate is making a distinction about how news people make use of Twitter versus the audience for news. I mean, I think that's what the, the terms of debate are. And I guess if you're not a news person with, and you do have a limited amount of time during the day and you want, you're a consumer of news, is being on Twitter the best use of your time or should you turn it back to professionals who have done some of the editing for you and uh, have actually applied their professional judgment about things that you might need to know about? I think that Stephen got it right when he said that Twitter is those notes that you used to leave in your notebook until you actually wrote the story, and I think that's a perfect example, because the problem is Twitter is a lot less like turning on the TV or the radio and a lot more like calling your aunt's sister's friend, seeing what they think about the situation. You don't know what you're going to get. It could be right, it could be wrong, and um, we have to be really careful about that. For instance, when there was the shooter in Moncton recently, you know, it went around Twitter that the guy was, gone, was dead about 24 hours before that was the case. And that is a very dangerous thing um, that people were sharing. So we need to be really, really careful, even when news media are sharing these things, we cannot necessarily trust it the way we can more vetted things like the morning paper. And live and breaking legacy media have made similar mistakes over time throughout history. Um, who are you following is always the question. And the importance of the kinds of critical thinking skills, I'm going to steal a page from Laura's book here, 
The kinds of critical thinking skills that you learn in a place like King's are part of what makes Twitter good, useful to you because you bring those to bear on everything you look at all the time. If you follow enough people on Twitter, you can't do anything else but follow their feeds. <laughs> and, true. you know, for me, I am much happier when at the end of the day I can tune in to a TV newscast, even though I would not generally want to talk about TV newscasts, but I could t turn into that or read the morning paper where it's been assembled for me in a coherent form. Uh, if, I, if I follow Twitter, if that's my way into the news, uh, unless I'm following it continuously, I will miss most things. But if you hear something is happening, where's the first place you go? So it's a breaking news Do you wait for argument. six? I go to the breaking news site on CBC. They'll tweet it out first. He's lying. <laughs> After, After I've seen it on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, sir. <coughs> And I would say, go for the unfollow button. <laughs> and look for the long form that's there. Stephen is right. Twitter is investing because Twitter is evolving. Twitter is investing in taking you to places that make Twitter more of a headline service and less of only the news. This, you'll get the same problem with a newspaper if all you read is the headline. And with that, I think actually we're going to have to uh, wind this up because we're nearly at the finish point. Last comments. First, uh, from the pro Twitter verse, and then from the anti Twitter verse. Any last thoughts? I want to finish with a story. First, a quote. Edward R. Murrow, one of the most famous journalists of the 20th century, helped to, reinvent, helped to invent radio news, then he went on to help invent television news, and gave a legendary speech in 1958 in which he said, If we don't make the best use of this invention, television, all it is is lights and wires in a box. Twitter and all social media are like that. It is what we make of it and how we use it. The story, because I can't resist it, is about a Japanese journalist who was kidnapped by insurgents in Afghanistan several years ago. And this reflects the importance of engagement with Twitter and social media. Because one of his kidnappers got a new cell phone. The guy was, kid was kept prisoner for five months. And during this, the, one of his kidnappers came to him and asked him to show him how to use his new cell phone. <laughs> In the process of showing his kidnapper how to use his cell phone, the journalist sent out tweets saying he was still alive and OK. So if we don't engage in these things, the terrorists win. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was low. <laughs> All right, so Sue's right. We do evolve the broadcast methods that we use, but let's think about this for a minute. We went from print to radio, we've added sound here, to TV, okay, we've got pictures, to Twitter, I don't see what we're adding here. I think we're actually taking a lot of steps back to we fitting as many characters as you can chip onto the cave wall. <laughs> let's be careful about how we use Twitter. Because the more that we use it like a news service or a news crawl, the more people, okay, might think that that's where they should get their news. And as the media slowly slip away because everyone is using Twitter to get their news and not paying for it anywhere, will they even notice once we're gone in the ever streaming stream of tweets that come past you every moment? Will they even notice that their news is no longer being provided by checked sources but by your sister's friend's friend. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay. Uh, no, we, we have, we're we have five minutes. Oh, 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 oh. We're, we're not Sorry finished. there. Well, like Sue, I want to end with a story. Uh, and like Twitter, I want to, this story is irrelevant to just about anything else that you've heard today. <laughs> but I'm going to tell it anyway, uh, as, as we do on Twitter. Uh, when I was a young academic at King's and, and John was the president, John was known as the globe-trotting president. He had lots of interest beyond the mundane affairs of King's. And one day I was in the quad and I ran into a more seasoned academic who said, did you hear the joke? I said, no. He said, what's the difference between God and Godfrey? I said, I don't know. He said, the answer is that God is here, there, and everywhere. And Godfrey is everywhere but here. <laughs> and that took more than 140 characters to tell. <laughs> so, we, we now come to the fun bit, which is the, the count. And I'm going to ask uh, Gregor uh, and the gentleman who's busy on his Blackberry over Tim. there to come and count. <laughs> I, need, I need counters. <laughs> he was tweeting, undoubtedly. Yes, all right. So the way this works is we're, uh, last time we gave you three choices. That was far too many. We're going to just do, keep it simple. So, Gregor, you're in charge of counting over on this side. You're counting the middle, and I'm counting over there. And so the way this works, it's pretty binary. Uh, you get to vote either that, that Twitter is the future of the news. In other words, you're supporting this team, or you get to oppose it. So we're going to begin by all those who are in favor of the proposition. Would you please stand? Whoa. <laughs> Scant. So if you count, this doesn't look like a big. All right. I think we um, didn't. All right. Those who think that Twitter is not the future of news, please stand. Hmm. <laughs> it was the hats. It was the hats. I think we want a different demographic. <laughs> a recount. Yeah. I want to lodge a protest for the hats. <laughs> well, it was very close. Uh, <laughs> those, uh, those who uh, were in favor. Oh, there were at least 14 of you. Um, those who were anti, uh, there were 56 of you. And so, Thank you. Congratulations. And with that, the debates end and enjoy the lunch. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Yay, you. <coughs> well, 